we've been in a study. Uh, every year I, I do a study on creation, and I wanted to break from Genesis, so I went to Romans, because Paul talks about it, and then this is where we are in verse 26, 27. We started with creation, and now we're into the new covenant church age. And uh, in verse 26, 27, and in the same way the Spirit, that's a capital S, also helps our weaknesses. Spirit helps our weaknesses. That means these weaknesses are not in opposition, but we can't carry through spiritually into some kind of productive spirituality. And that's why he's there. And usually that's due on the positive side. That's due to um, a breakdown in the faith cycle, like we've been talking on Sunday, where the faith cycle broke down, especially on prolonged periods of suffering. Uh, you know, you can be a very strong believer like Job was. I mean, when, when God described Job, I mean, we would all love to be called that by God, right? I mean, the way he described him uh, as a man of great integrity, integrity being a, uh, uh, an effect of spiritual maturity, man of great integrity. And we see Job struggle under the prolonged suffering, especially physical. He went through it. And, and he was all over the place with it, too. And so, anyhow, the, in the same way, which is a reference back to 8, 18 through 25, when he says, and in the same way, you're going to have to go back and read verses 18 through 25, which we've studied. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And this is really important you understand this. Where is the groaning? We got, we got two people here. We got the believer and we got the Holy Spirit in the believer, right? We've got the believer and we've got the Holy Spirit in the believer. Where's the groaning? In the Spirit, not in the believer. The Spirit is in the believer. The groaning is in the Spirit. Now, we've already talked about the groaning of the Christian in verse 23. Look at verse 23. Not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. You understand? That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about that here. And a lot of people make a mistake by not understanding it. They think that this is <clears throat> groaning within the believer over prayer, and it's not. Charismatic people use this. This is not the text to use. Also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how we should pray for, but the Spirit himself. See, we had we ourselves. We understood that meant alone. We ourselves, individually. Now he says the Spirit himself, and it means the Spirit alone. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, that he who searches the heart is God. God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And you know what the mind of the Spirit is? God's. Right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're the same person. They're, they're the same essence, but different people, right? Different persons in the Trinity or the Godhead. God who searches the heart knows the mind what of the Spirit, the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to, and the will of God, it should be in italics because it's not in the original text. That's not what it says, and it's misleading. What it should say, because he intercedes for the saints according of God. The he and God and the Holy Spirit, 
the spirit, and this is why this is the, 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 groaning, the groaning too deep for words is why it's the language of omniscience. It's the language of omniscience. It's God who knows the mind of God and the mind of the Holy Spirit are one. And so when it speaks, it speaks to the language of omniscience on behalf of the believer. The believer is not engaged in this. The believer, believer don't know how to do that. The believer couldn't do it if he did know how to do it. You understand? We have to speak intelligent. We have to speak the word of God back to God. We can't speak outside the realm of that. You understand that? Well, anyhow, there's a lot of confusion over this, these verses because they don't pay attention to it. Uh, they don't pay attention to the, what the writer is actually saying, what Paul is actually saying. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into this study today talking about the intercessory ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We are in the church age. We are in the new covenant. This is new covenant, which we've been talking about on Tuesday night. So I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin if necessary. Why? Because it's classroom etiquette. The Holy Spirit is in the believer's life to be able to give him the maximal hour of, of learning. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The Holy Spirit is what makes us spiritual. It's not a religious book. It's a spiritual book. For a believer, this is a spiritual book. It's not a religious book. For an unbeliever, it's a religious book. For a believer, it's a spiritual book. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's job is to teach it on the learning side and to live it on the practical side of our life, the living part of it. We walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We walk by faith and not by sight. These are the principles. And so the issue tonight, as you said in Bible study, if the Holy Spirit is going to teach you, you have to be under his directive care ministry. And you, you know, you can't, if you're carnal and you could be a believer and be carnal, the evidence of it would be personal sin that you would be aware of. <clears throat> and if you are, then you have to confess that sin this is the operation of sanctification in the Christian's life to bring you back out of carnality into spirituality. Confess your sin. It brings you back. The blood of Christ works for you. This is all 1 John 5 through 9. 5 talks about fellowship. 7 talks about the work of Christ. And verse 9 says this work, this is how the, the work of Christ on the cross is extended to the Christian life. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Talking about he, God. He is faithful and to for, you know, just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our rights. So I give you a moment to do that. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and overt sins should be confessed in silence. Should be done prior to study. We'll get that done and then we'll get into study. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we understand the protocol for classroom ethics. Being able to sit down and study the Bible under the Ministry of the Holy Spirit. Can that do that in carnality? No more than an unbeliever could do it as he walked in the door. It's not a religious book. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister both to those who have come by automobile today as well as internet. And we pray the same classroom etiquette that we talk about would be applied to their life where they are, they need to be able to get in a situation in life where they're not distracted for the next hour and be able to concentrate upon the word of God and study it so the ministry of the Holy Spirit can sow it and then begin to produce from it through the Christian life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the greater, greater discussion that we've, we're involved in has gone back to Romans 8, chapter 18 through 27, uh, called the Romans view of creation, Paul's Paul in, out of the book of Romans. And what is interesting, we always looking for markers, always looking for markers for study. This one's really b great because Paul used, this is typical Paul, but Paul used three great markers to divide verses 18 through 27. He used the word groaning. Now the verbal form of that 
stanezo is 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 a word that groaning groaning the expression of fe- inner the inner expression of the feeling of sorrow or grief grieve not the holy spirit mm-hmm. business and so that's a that's so that's the interesting word that's used there and it's used three 18 through 22 there's groaning 23 through 25 there's groaning uh in verses 26 27 there's groaning so Paul, what he has done, he's taken that and he's broken that sec- that whole passage down into three divisions. 18 through 22, he's talking about creation groaning. The creation groaning. The little flowers, and they're groaning. Trees are groaning. Now, you'd have to have good ears to hear it, right? But he calls it groaning. Then he goes to verses 23 and 25, and he talks about Christians groaning in their body. Then he goes to 26, 27, he talks about the whole, the indwelling Holy Spirit groaning within himself. And the common denominator of all this groaning is the curses associated with Adam's original sin. So that, that we, and we know that. We've studied that. This is not like, so we've looked at that and we've studied that and that's where we are tonight. <clears throat> the Greek word, as I mentioned, uh, kind of helps us put all of that in perspective. The key word that is used in this for grief helps us understand it. Then Paul, of course, in verses 18 through 22, tell us. And so it takes us back to Adam's sin in, in uh, Genesis 2, 17. Don't eat her from the tree. He ate. Then there were curses associated with that sin. There were curses. When you go to Genesis, the third chapter, 13 through, through, the, through the chapter, you will see that there were certain curses put on that, that on, on the serpent, all the participants in it, both direct and indirect. And uh, when you get to verses Genesis 3, 17, 18, and 19, you get in the curse. Of, the ground was cursed. And that's how this whole thing, Paul starts out with that. And then he's covering this whole ball game. He covers the groaning of creation, the groaning of us in our body associated with that. And then the, the groaning of the Holy Spirit who is in our body. And so all of that is linked up. And we have studied that. And those who are visiting with us on the Internet, you know, you've jumped in. If this is your first visit, you've jumped in at the tail end of a study that's been going on for weeks. So you can go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com, and you can pick up all the back on this. And it would be well worth your study if you find this interesting tonight. Because this is the tail end of a study. We're about to close this study down, and we're at the at the end of it. Um, now, another word that's of great interest to us in this section is the word intercession. Now, I wrote the Greek word entuka kanoa uh, on it, E-N-T-U-G-C-H-A-N-O, entuk kaneo. It refers to this word intercession, as you might understand, refers to conversing or pleading on behalf of another. That's intercession. And in it, that we understand that because it's, the English is very close to the understanding of intercession. The lesson we'll study tonight will study four aspects of the intercessional, the intercessory ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we will address a couple of questions in this lesson. For example, why is the Holy Spirit groaning? Why does the Holy Spirit need to intercede? How does it benefit the believer? We'll try to answer some of those questions because they're probably very good questions on it. The church age believer, what we learn from Romans 8, 26, 27 is that the church age believers are never left alone. The moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit up takes up residence in your soul. Galatians 3, 1 through 3. Acts 19, 2. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And when he takes up residence at the point of salvation because the blood of Christ has made it possible for him to enter your corrupt body, Right? He changes 
his presence inside your body changes the nomenclature of your body spiritually to naos, the holies of holies. That's a big deal. One of the intercessory ministries, there are several, but one of them, one of them uh, is very important to us as we begin our study tonight because one of those intercessory ministry is to help us bear our burdens. Look at this. Um, let me get back to my text here. He says, and in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. See the word helps? That's a powerful word. There's uh, the word help. This word help is beyond that simple word. It sounds like very simple word. Okay, wait, I'll, come here, I'll help you. While the word help is interesting, if you look at the Greek word, it's made up of, it's a triple compound word. It has a prepossession, sun, S-U-N, that looks like sun, S-U-N, and then anti, anti, A-N-T-I, that's a preposition. There's two prepositions, and then the verb is lambano. The verb lambano means to receive something. Then you've got soon, soon on the front of this means together. It means that there's a joint venture here going on, and ante means against, something against it uh, or, or down from it. it it's a, a word. Um, when, you, when it's put together, it means to, that the Holy Spirit is there to help you, to help you carry a burden. He's there to help you. He's not there to carry it. He's helped you to carry it. And if you're smart, what you're going to do with that burden? First Peter 5, 6, and 7, you're going to cast it on the Lord. Cast your burdens on the Lord. He's there to help you lift that burden and give it to Jesus. You understand that? Because his job is always to glorify him, not himself. When you find people glorifying the Holy Spirit, you're in trouble. Because the job of the Holy Spirit, he makes it very clear in John 14, 15, 16, his job is is to is to glorify Christ, is to glorify God and to push Christ. He is there to witness of the person and work of Christ. So this word help is really a strong word. This word is stronger than it looks because he is, listen to me, he is always there no matter what the burden, he is always there to help you lift that burden up and give it to Jesus. You understand? Because he's the burden-carrying Christ. Now, what you do is you get burdened and you try to call a hundred people to come and help you when you've got the only person that can truly help you get it done. And then if you, if you farm it out to other people who are weak like you, then you get disappointed and, and get against these people because they didn't help you when they should have come and helped you. The truth of the matter is the burden that you have as a believer in Jesus Christ, you already have a supernatural power lifter in your life, a supernatural power lifter. He's there as a power lifter to lift your burden so that you can give it to Jesus. That's, a, that's exactly what this complicated Greek word says. I mean, it took a compound word to explain that. And I just did it in no time to try to get you to understand how important this word is. So one of the intercessory ministers, ministries that the indwelling Holy Spirit has, listen, stop, stop whining, stop complaining, stop inviting every Tom, Dick, and Harry, you remember them guys, into your life to lift something that they can't lift together all of the king's man can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Can't happen. You've got a supernatural power lifter in your life. Agreed? That's what he says. He's there to what? Help. But now you know what that word means. It's much more than help. You've got a supernatural power lifter. 
So why would you go to anywhere? Why would you go to other? other people may come to your rescue and you may come to your aid because they got the gift of helps. And when they get there, you know that this is an internal lift that has to be done. You say, well, listen, if I need you, I'll call you tomorrow, right? <laughs> because t right now I've got, I've got my supernatural power lifter working. And odds are, odds are he will take care of that, especially when it's an internal. And you, listen, first of all, you're probably not going to explain it to these people that come. Well, what do you want me to help you move or lift or what? You, it's one of those things inside your soul that's personal. You understand what I'm saying about? You may not be ready to explain it to anybody else. You may not want to explain it to anybody else. You don't have to. <laughs> you got the supernatural power lifter in your life. I mean, he's there to assist you. He's not going to do it on his own. He's an intercessor. That's why you have to walk in the spirit, Perry Pateo. You have to walk in the spirit. You have to walk present tense all the time. It's a continuance. All right. So one of the intercessory ministry is to help bear a burden in our weaknesses. See that? Now, here's what a weakness is. I, it's got a definite article, T-E, and then this Greek word, this is a typical Greek word for weakness. It means to be without sufficient strength for the task. Listen, whether real or imagined. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, some of this stuff is phony baloney. And you think it's real. It's phony baloney. But listen, you don't know. You think, eh, and it's just an imagination. You're, you're burdened by an imagination. It's not a real. It's You've imagined it. To be real. Tell me you not have done this. Jeez. Now sometimes your conscience goes like, quit that. That's not, why are you doing that? But if it, if the conscience doesn't catch it, the Holy Spirit does. Now he's, he's, he's there to lift real burdens. But he may, he's also there to clarify that's not real. You understand? And when he tells you that, he's going, to put, he's going to put some doctrinal information with it that you've learned, and you need to accept that. You're not, you need to quit trying to, you need to stop quit creating stuff that doesn't need to be there. Oh, I just want, I wonder what, they, I wonder what they're doing. Oh, I wonder what's happening. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, I haven't heard from him in a week. Oh, my God, what, well, oh. What are you doing? Is that real or is that imagined? What I just did, is that real or imagined? You've made, you listen, we used to say you made a mountain out of a molehill. That's what we used to say. Huh? self induced well, sure it is. self induced misery. But listen, he's even there to intercess on that. You understand? Because he, he's, to, he's to guide you. He's to guide you into all truth. And listen, some of those are the hardest times when he goes like, that's phony baloney. And you go like, oh, it's, it's real to me. No, it ain't. That wouldn't hold, that wouldn't hold court for a, a, a minute. Not real about that. You just like to be miserable. There are days that you just want to be miserable. I do not. Well, then stop it. You stop it. Who's in control of your life? You make sure nobody else is. How about yourself? You know, we are our worst enemies very often. And that's what spiritual growth. So here's a word for weakness. It means to be without sufficient strength for a task, whether real or imagined. But you have no idea how much he works in your life. I mean, he's so glad when you go to sleep. Especially when you go into deep sleep, because before you hit deep sleep, he don't get a break. He go like, hey, 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 I'm here. Where have you just tried to take me? Quit that. He drops in deep sleep. He says, oh, thank you, Lord, for that wonderful thing called deep sleep. I get a break here. You're gonna give me a cup of coffee. I need a cup of coffee so bad. I don't know. Maybe done drink coffee. I don't know. 
Church age believers are never left alone to bear the burdens of life in that wonderful idea. Is that not a doctrinal point? Is that not a doctrinal point? I didn't see you write it down. What? That's a doctrinal point, isn't it? I mean, now listen. Here's what God says to you. God says to you, I'll never leave, leave you nor forsake you. That's God the Father, the author of the whole plan of your life. Here he's put the Holy Spirit and he says, and I'm here, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I hope you bear the burdens, whether real or imagined. Now listen, we'd quit that job if we had it about the first week. First day. <laughs> Pam's leaving the first day. Probably the first hour. Not only does God promise, but also the Holy Spirit. He's put the Holy Spirit in, inside every church age believer. Uh, and listen, not only, listen, I love this. Not only will, help, will he help you lift your burden so you can give it to Jesus in 1 Peter 5. But listen, he's there to give you the joy for the journey. Right? Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Joy. We've been talking about that out of our Sunday lesson. Consider it all joy when you fall into the muck and mire. So here's another doctrinal point. We are never left to bear the burden of life alone. The indwelling is for ministering to the individual church age believer, such as in our lesson. And you know what? Boy, listen, if... There were probably a lot of people that thought, boy, I wish I had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. None of them had it. Look at the big guys, Abraham and all these guys would have loved to have what you got. You don't take advantage of it. Holy Spirit never dwelled in them. It dwelled alongside them for short periods of time, never permanently. And when they had them, their life was way up here. And when they didn't have it, they were, they were sucking for air. Boy, they beg, please don't take it from me. Please don't take it from me. Please don't take it from me. And we have it. And we, don't even, we don't even give it a second thought. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. I hope you, and listen, you're going to need every bit of them too because we live in the intensity of the angelic conflict. We live in the last days. If there was ever a group of people that needed indwelling, we have it, and he is not there for just on a vacation or something. And he's a working, he's as much working in our life as Christ was when he was on the earth. He is, he's been assigned task with, within each of our personal lives. Can you imagine that? How do you keep up with all that? I don't know. And you say, well, what do you mean the intensity of the angelic? Hebrews 1-2. Hebrews 1, 2. These believers that we're dealing with in Romans, these believers were suffering the groaning of the burden of the curses of the angelic conflict, like in verse 22 and 23, like the suffering travail of childbirth. And where did it come from? It come from Genesis 3, 16, the childbirth, and then went to 17, 18, and 19 to the earth. And so forth. That's what... When we, when we enter the eighth chapter of Romans in verse 26, he says, and in the same way, he's talking about the creation groaning. He's talking about the believer groaning. And now he's talking about the Holy Spirit who is on earth in us groaning. That's what he means by that. When he says, and in the same way, you know, I know you're great students and I love teaching you. But when you run, if you, if you jump in a passage and it says, and in the same way, are you not obligated to read back, back from it? If you see the word therefore, are you not required to read back? Don't be a lazy Christian. Don't be a lazy Christian. You'll always be dumb. The Holy Spirit has been said to make you brilliant, a genius in the word of God. Don't, don't let them, don't be fooled by all that stuff. There's a similar phrase in Romans 8, chapter verse 23, when it says, and not only this, it's a reference back. And not only this, what's he talking about? And not only this, it's not left to your imagination. You go back and you look, you read 18, 19, uh, 20, 21, 20, 
there you have it. Then you get to 23. He's talking about what's going on in creation is going on in the Christian. What's going on in creation and going on in the Christian is also going on in the Holy Spirit who lives inside the body of a believer on earth. That's all about this earth business. In verse 23, but we, but also we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting eagerly see that word eagerly waiting eagerly it's a compound word it's a triple compound it's got apple ek those are two prepositions and then decomai maybe this is another one of those when you see a triple compound word that's lights out in the greek language when he adds on listen when he when you put one preposition on a word it, it, it soups it up. You put two of them on? I mean, you got a car that can go 500 miles an hour in three seconds or something. I mean, that's souped to the max. That's souping it to the max. When you got a triple compound, and we got two of them in this. <laughs> that's pretty powerful stuff, I'm telling you. But, and listen... There's a groaning in verses 23, 24, and 25. There's a groaning within the Christian, eagerly awaiting. And what's he eagerly awaiting? What's he eagerly awaiting? Listen to this. Here's what he says. For the adoption as sons for the redemption of our body. You know what that is? We call that our resurrection. When, when are you going to get that? rapture it ends our it ends our dispensational period waiting eagerly for what the, eagerly waiting for what this word is used in 1819 it's used in 21 it's used in 23 waiting eagerly for what uh, the resurrection of our body What's happening? What we're growing we're we're groaning within that body as it begins to listen not on the front side of it on the back side of it. <laughs> you know, and everybody knows. Well, you know why your skin does this, and you know why you do this, and you know why you do that? Right? Because your body's decaying. Everything's slowing down. Eventually, it'll all shut down, and we call that death. Okay? It's all right. Yeah, sure it is. But it might, might as well be, right? We well, can't do nothing about it. Might as well just enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Another important, another important new covenant inter, in, uh, intercessory ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit is prayer on behalf. Prayer that's offered on behalf of the church age believer. That church age believer who's going through undeserved suffering or suffering in life that has become an enormous burden in him. He is burdened. He is suffering. It is the undeserved suffering of living within a corruptible body in the angelic conflict. Now, if you want a good example of this, a good example of this is Job. He's a classic example of it. But so is Paul, and, and you've probably got people that you could write their name in because I know people that went through what Job went through and went through it just like Job went through it, uh, and, and maybe because of Job went through it better as far as enlightenment. An example of undeserved suffering was Satan, this angelic conflict, Satan testing of Job's faith relationship with the Lord. That's what that was all about, wasn't it? You remember Job 1 and 2? Oh, you better go back and read that one day. And, and what did he, the first time he took all of his possessions and his family, all the details of life from his life, he took all of his details of life away from him. And he, he hung tough with the integrity of God. You know, naked I come, naked I go. Chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came in, naked I go. What did I care? God gave it anyhow. So he, he says, can we have another conference? So we go to we go to Job two. 
He comes in the second time, and God tells him the same thing. My man Job, righteous, blameless, upright man, full of integrity for me. Satan says, I'll tell you what. I was easy on him the last time. You let me get after his physical being, and he will curse you to your face. Right? Remember that? that? Yeah, second chapter. And God says, okay, you got him, but you can't kill him. You can take him right down to the, you can take him right down to it, but you can't do it. Right? That's what he told him. And that's the and that is the book of Job. Until you get to the last chapter. So last couple chapters. That is the story of Job. And listen, it's a wonderful story of Job because we'll go through we go through that stuff. And listen, we got something Job didn't have. We've got an intercessory third member of the Godhead living within us. And how 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 big and tough is he is in the angelic conflict? First John 4 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I mean, you could I, listen, he's saying you could arm wrestle with the devil and beat him if you got the strength of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because he's a he's a supernatural power lifter. You understand that? Now, the devil, he, he'd love to arm wrestle you or me. He'd make us look so bad, and he'd never do it in private. See, the Holy Spirit does all this in private. He'd never do it in private. He'd make sure that he had everybody that thought you were a big guy on campus, he'd have you around when he took you down. Well, anyhow. A care, the caregiver of Job, which was his wife, God bless her. The caregiver of Job, his wife, understood the analogy of travail of childbirth, right? She gave, she, she had a ton of kids compared to what I would normally think. Associated with prolonged suffering. You know, listen, enough's enough. He t Look, I've already lost everything I've had, right? You know, what, you know what her area of curse was? Her children, right? Lost it all, lost her house, lost her prestige, lost all the money, got down to nothing, nothing but the shirt on her back. And then round two comes up. And Job shows up in this deal. Enough is enough. And listen, she says, go ahead and curse God and die. I don't know that that, I don't, listen, the more I've studied that, and the more I've become involved in all this kind of stuff, I'm, listen, I'm not sure that that wasn't a plea for pity rather than hostility. That was a bad one. <laughs> But this is a caretaker, a caregiver that's up to here, worn out, and with a lot too many losses. And now she's got a guy, and in prolonged suffering, this was her attitude about it. I don't fault her for that. It's stupid. It's, it's thinking like the world. You know what she just said to him? Commit, listen, she said, commit spiritual suicide. Spiritual suicide. Get God to do it. You know, he didn't say, well, listen, why don't you just do it if you want it? Because it, she wasn't a frame of mind to say that to her. I don't know. Just thinking. Thinking out loud, apparently. And Job answers her much like Jesus answered Peter in, in Matthew 16 when he said, uh, you're a stumbling block to me because your mind, your mind somewhere it shouldn't be. Your mind ought to be in the Lord, and it's not where it ought to be. Your mind is not where it ought to be. I understand you're going through some stuff, but your mind isn't where it ought to be. Listen, your mind always ought to be in Christ. It ought to be all, always. Your mind should be in Hebrews 12:2. Always in Hebrews 12:2. Focus, focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Focus on Jesus. 
you got the Holy Spirit to lift that burden, pass it right off. And he, he gives his wife good advice. He says, you talk like a foolish person. You talk like a foolish person. I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw God under the bus. There's no way. Listen, this is a good thing that's happened to me. But he found out. He found out that every day there was a lot of suffering involved to be able to say this is a good thing that's happened to me. He said it when he lost everything. And he, he had to come. Every day he was forced. Satan put him right, put his nose right to the ground. And every day forced him to say, curse God. And he refused to do it every day. And so he just wretched it up a little more. And every day he get up. This is what he had to look forward to. He had to fight the devil every day. He had to fight the devil every day. And the devil put him right on the ground, stuck his nose in it, buried his nose in it, and said, and he wouldn't do it. He got back on his feet and praised God. And he struggled with it. He struggled with it. But he always got back on his feet. Like I said Sunday, listen, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back on your feet because he tells you to finish the course and keep the faith. He tells you to fight the fight. Doesn't tell you you have to win it. You got to fight it. Get back on your feet and fight it. That's a winner for God. That's a winner. When the 13th round come, you didn't win. You didn't win. Jesus said you're a winner because you're still on your feet. You got up you're on your feet every time because of who I am, not who, what, who you are. I'm just telling you, th this is what it means to believe in Christ. Here's, here's Philippians 129. It has been granted for you not only to believe in Jesus, but to suffer for his sake. It's a privilege. When that knocks on your door, and it could well knock on your door, listen, it, it's in many forms. The angelic conflict knocks on your door in a whole lot of different forms. You embrace it. Because it's a good thing God has done for you. It's not a bad thing. Don't listen to the world tell you, well, if that was my God, I, I wouldn't follow him one more day. <laughs> Here's point three. The intercessory prayer ministry of the Spirit is essential during prolonged periods of undeserved suffering is Paul's point. The Lord recalled this doctor to Paul while going through prolonged suffering of himself in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. He referred to it as a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. King James called it buffet. And to keep me from exalting myself. Oh, ho, ho. listen, God put it on his life. The devil would love to have you exalt yourself, wouldn't he? But Paul understood, I got to get back up on my feet because God is doing a good work in me. He's burning out the pride so I can be humble. And humble means having a grace attitude about life. No matter what, it, no matter what God puts on your plate, you have a humble attitude because it's all about grace. It's all about God. It's not about me. At some point in your life as a believer, you got to give your life over to God 110%. And then it's always about him, never about you, because you've quit that. You've quit playing that game. And, uh, and it won't go without testing. I mean, it sounds good in classroom. It sounds good because it's not on your plate. But it won't, go, it won't go without testing. The devil makes sure of that. It won't go without testing. Nor will it go without great reward. Nor will it go without great reward. Like Job and Paul, the spiritual lesson to be learned for us are often in the midst of great suffering. Great lessons. When you're in the midst of great suffering... And listen, it's only great to you. It's not, you don't listen to other people tell you whether what you're going through is big or little. 
You, you, let, you, you gauge the own suffering you're going through. When you tell it somebody else, they look at you go like, that ain't nothing. So you don't tell anybody next time because it's bigger than you and they, they just belittle it. Listen, you gauge it, right? One person has this headache. Another person has another headache. Another person has that kind of headache. Everybody's got a headache, right? It's, listen, God knows what he's got. You. He, listen, you know why that's important? Because he never puts more on you than you're able to bear. Agreed? And listen, he puts it there not for you to bear, but for the Holy Spirit to help you lift it up in order to give that burden to Jesus. He's a burden-carrying Savior. Doesn't ask you to carry that alone. Every day, and every, it's an everyday thing. And there are all kinds of conflicts in your life. Listen, you go like, well, I, I don't have an earache. I don't have a headache. I don't have a backache. I physically feel pretty good. Yeah. Well, there's other stuff going on in your life. Let's not focus on the physical. Let's focus on the stuff that's going on. You know, what is the stuff that makes you want to go off in the corner and cry? And what is that? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying about it. Listen, when you're going through suffering, and it could be in a lot of different forms now, don't have to be like Job's. And it, you know, when you go through suffering, undeserved suffering, whatever it is in your life, it's in the midst of that suffering where great Bible lessons are going to be taught to you. You got to quit sucking your thumb and crying in a corner. You've got to re return your focus upon Jesus Christ. And what is he trying to teach me? Because great lesson. Listen, you know where I learned that? I learned that from Job, and I learned it from Paul. Because when you read 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 10, he talks about going through, you know, I have a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Yada, yada, right? So you ask your question like I did. What's being taught? I mean, life itself sucks. So what's God trying to do? I mean, life is tough. Just in itself. I mean, I knew that before I ever came to, to faith in Christ. So what's, a, and so when you, listen, when you go back in there, let, let, let's go there for just a minute. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. And what she, Paul talks about this. Paul tells you, I learned this lesson from Paul. He said, there are great lessons to be learned in suffering that you might not learn because your focus is distracted, where you're not focused on what he's trying to teach you. And he's always trying to teach something to you personally. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not big theology stuff. It's internal, absolute necessary stuff that... You've got furniture in your life that has to be, some has to be taken and burned, some has to be taken and sold, some has to be changed around, the furniture has to be moved around. And so this, so when you go to this and you look at 12 and you look at verse 9 and 10, he gets into this. He said, you know, he's prayed three times and now he says, and he said to me, there's, here's the first lesson, right? Now, we're going to look for markers. Pay attention. We're looking for markers because there's lessons in the markers. So you always look for markers. There's a marker called power in weakness. Look at verse 9. My grace is sufficient here for power is perfected in weakness. In other words, it complete power complete is the completer of weakness. You want you you feel okay, I and you're going through that struggle? There's power in weakness. See, Paul, Paul is there. Take this away from me. Take this away from me. Take this away from me. No, you haven't learned why it's there. Well, it's there to keep me from exalting myself. I know, but it's not working. You've asked me three times. First lesson, grace is sufficient. Listen to me. Paul, Paul stops him. Listen, I can see Paul. Paul stops him right there. 
right there, he stops him. He goes like, listen, I'm the, I'm the champion of grace. There's nobody in the church that understands grace better than I. I, Paul, the apostle that you assigned, you have to, I know more about grace. You understand that, don't you? But listen to what God says. God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. What has he not learned about? Oh, he's got the theology of grace down. And he's passionate about it. But what he's missed is there's something in his old man structure of thinking that won't allow grace to be sufficient. In his life. And he tells him what it is. He says, for power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. You're not letting grace reach through. Listen, listen to me now. What's his problem? Listen, he's prideful. How do I know it? Because God put this on him to keep him from exalting himself. His pride wasn't that he was arrogant and everything, he was, but he wasn't arrogant in his teaching. Right? He goes to heaven, he gets this revelation, and he's all fired up. But he's thinking of a thousand different ways to teach it when he gets back. He comes back and says, you can't teach any of it. And God knew the structure of his belief system and shut it down. And now he's working on him to consent to have it shut down. In order to do it, he's got to take him from pride to humility. And that's when grace works in your life. When grace is sufficient, it's working humility in your life. But let me tell you, for some of us, that was a tough lesson. For some of us, that was a tough lesson. Now, here's how it works out. Let me tell you how God wants this thing to work out in his life. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather, I would rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, see, this is that, well, that's the first lesson. Therefore, I am well content. That's the second lesson. I've learned to be content. And Paul talks about in the book of Philippians, I think, I, I've learned to be content. No matter whether, no matter what my situation, I've learned to be content. But this, this content he's talking about is in relation to God in him with grace being sufficient. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am re weak, then I am strong. There it is. L let me tell you, and you can find it in Job. You can find it. Listen, this is what you must discover when you go through suffering. God is trying to burn something out of you in order to replace something in you that promotes Christ. We call that taking off the old man and putting on the new man. If you want to read it out in clear terms, you should read not, listen, you should read Ephesians 4 and start with verse 17 and read through verse 24. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now that, listen, that reads good and lives hard. You would have thought the last person in the whole wide world would have a problem with this would be Paul. By the time we get to 2 Corinthians, it would be Paul. And just because you understand the Word of God, just because you teach the Word of God, doesn't mean that God's not trying to get some things out of your life that are distracting for people to see Christ in you. I mean, he choked me down about, I don't know, I don't, the years escaped me. But he got me pretty hard at least halfway into my ministry, at least after my first 20 years in my ministry in this church. He choked me down. He said, you're an absolute jerk. You're an absolute jerk. You talk about Christ living in you, nobody can see it because too much of Ron ate him. And I, I argued with him for a while, and that, that argument never wins. It didn't win with Paul. It didn't win with me either. And I went back and looked at Paul. 
and what holy kept is. What God wants is not the understanding of grace. He wants the action of grace in your life where grace is sufficient to promote Christ. The Holy Spirit is not, there, is not in your life to promote you. If you think he is, you're wrong. If you think the Holy Spirit is promoting you in your ministry, you're wrong. You're promoting him, but he isn't. He promotes Christ or he don't promote. I'm just telling you. Hebrews, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2, is a dynamite passage. You need to keep asking yourself when you're going through suffering, you're going through difficult times in your life. Listen, what, listen to Paul when he talks about the chain. He had to learn it with insults and persecution and yada, yada. It goes through a whole list that God ran him through in order to teach him humility. Now, God's not, listen, he's not trying to humiliate you to get you to, humil to, 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 get you to humbleness. You understand? That's the devil's system. It's not God's. But he's going to keep working with you to try to get you out of a way of thinking that's self-destructive and doesn't promote Christ. It, all it does is push you out front. Never pushes Christ out front. Just push it. You're always pushing your agenda. If it's, if it's not my way, it's the highway. What kind, of, what kind of foolishness is that? You think, that's, you think that exemplifies the character of Christ in your life? I mean, you can spew Bible doctrine all day long. Come on. Paul was ready, was already, when God taught him this, he was already the champion of grace as far as the doctrine. So what was God trying to teach Paul? What did the Lord want Paul to know that was essential? And he's not going to let up on him. Listen, he could have asked, he, if he hadn't learned what God was trying to teach him, this would have went on. Paul prayed the 26,000th time. <laughs> and Paul, Paul is no longer in the ministry. God is not true. God is not faithful. So he's no longer in the ministry. So he's left the ministry and now he's working at Walmart. Because God isn't faithful. I slugged it out all of these years, and I was faithful to God, but he wasn't faithful to me. I went on all these trips, and I got bit by snakes, and I got, you know. You always pay attention to markers. Here's one, Ash, because I know we have some King James people. The Holy, the Holy Spirit that's called the helper, the counselor, is also called the comforter. King James calls it the comforter. It's made up of two Latin words. It's made up the word cum, means with, and the word forte, I put it on your paper, that means strength. That he has come in your life to give you strength, supernatural strength. The Holy Spirit is the power lifter. The supernatural power lifter to the Christian life. Groaning too deep for words is the language of omniscience. I've told you that before. It is the language between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit regarding the will of God in the bigger picture. The bigger picture that goes back and takes a look from the Eternal Life Conference. We can know the Bible as well as you can know it. It still is not what they saw in the bigger picture at the Eternal Life Conference. That's the language of accommodation. Well, anyhow, that's enough for today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Let the people that have, are on the Internet back to their uh, regular hours of whatever they do. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile or by the Internet. We're thankful, Father. We've, we've heard from several people that we had no idea we had lost touch with them over the years. And they have found us on the live streaming, and they have contacted us, and it was just good to know that that uh, they're still actively engaged in the Word of God out there. They're hungry for the truth, and and uh, they were able to hook up with us again, and people in different states and even out of the country, out of the out of America, are able to hook up with us, and and it's just wonderful to be a part of their life again, and. So here is the power of the internet, and uh, it, for me, it's a love hate. <laughs> it's a love hate relationship, and so, you know, Father, but 
every once in a while you you tell us there there that this is touching lives with the truth all around and so that's encouraging to us in Jesus name amen